Andy, um, it's awesome to have you on. Where are you coming in from today? We're in New York City. We've, uh, we've stayed the course. Where are you, by the way? It looks like you're running for, uh, you got the trees in the back and the U.S. Looks like you're running for governor of Colorado or something. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm out in Utah still. Um, so this has been my, my temporary location. So not, not running for governor yet. But what's, uh, what's with the tie? You look much more professional than I've that I've seen you recently. You know, I had a I had a chance to go on CNBC this morning talking about Walmart earnings, and so I had to get dressed up here in my home. And I was like, I don't think I've worn a blazer in six months, so it felt <laughs> it felt fun to kind of feel ready for work. So I thought I saw that we were getting together, and I thought I'd just keep it rolling. Nice, I love it. Um, well, I'm really excited to talk to you because a bunch of reasons. I would say one you've been kind of like a mentor to me as I've built my businesses. Um, but also you were kind of this, this uh, like standard bearer for all these brands, right. And in, in reimagining retail with, with Bonobos. And I want to talk through that with you. Um, and then I think just weirdly our stories have like interconnected in, in really interesting ways. Um, and maybe that's, that's where I'll start um, was, the way we actually originally got connected was um, I think I got a thrill list uh, email about Bonobos like back in 2007. I hadn't even applied to Stanford. You were at Stanford and I just had the, the gall or the audacity to just email the CEO and be like, really cool concept. Um, can I invest? And that was where this all started. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember getting that email. I was sitting at my kitchen table at an apartment at 17th Street in Irving. We were getting emails from a few people a day and I would reply within five seconds when a customer service email came in. And people would be like, oh my God, the CEO was replying because I had it in my signature. <laughs> and what I want to say is the CEO is actually the only person at the company right now. So yeah, it was, it was special when you reached out and it was, it was super cool that you became a customer. And I think if I'm remembering it right, an angel investor in the company from that, email exchange actually that was my i've i had never made an angel investment ever i'd never invested in a venture company so now it all started i don't know what you were thinking yeah i don't know <laughs> what you were thinking and that was the funny thing about bonobos in the early days was we couldn't really get anyone who invested professionally to invest there was no venture capital support for anything um in retail at the time certainly not the concept of direct consumer didn't exist and so we actually had to raise money from people like you who are our customers because you were a part of a small cohort of people that actually were excited about what we were doing, the rest of the world, less so. I just thought you made awesome pants. Um, and it, can you tell the story of like, how did it go from awesome pants to raising your first few rounds? Well, I mean, look, you, you were around at a time where it was both me and my co-founder, Brian Spaley, working together. And, he gets all the credit for having come up with this idea that men's pants don't fit well. We're going to fix it. We're going to build this pant with a curved waistband. It really was the, the product genius at the company. My only idea was let's build a brand on the internet. And it was a, it was funny. It was a contrarian thing at the time. I can remember sitting down with our, our business school professor, Joel Peterson saying, we're going to take these pants online and we're going to, we're going to sell them over the internet in a way that's, builds a closer connection with the customer than the traditional brick and mortar channel. And it's, you know, crazy. Here we are 14 years later thinking about all the ways that that was seems super innovative perhaps for the time, but now in, in many ways this is taken for granted that this is how, of course, digitally native, that's how you build brands now. And, and in that time, I'm just curious that that perspective of like building a brand online, which today is, just seems so intuitive, right? That's, that's what every brand does. They start online, they're, they're digitally native. What was so counterintuitive to investors and the world about that in 2007? I think first of all, retail in general is not something that technology venture capitalists and people in Silicon Valley at the time were thinking that much about. 
And it really wasn't until I, I think there was some momentum behind um, the Zappos story. And there was this company selling shoes that ended up being a hot company. And I think Sequoia invested. So I remember pitching Bonobos as we're going to build something like Zappos, but that's actually a brand. And I think there might've even been a page in our investor deck that's said like, oh, I, I don't really like when entrepreneurs do this. I don't know why I did it, but it was like Bonobos equals, you know, Ralph Lauren plus Zappos, or maybe it was times. I don't know if you add or you multiply things. Um, and so the, the conversation I can remember having with people at the time was, well, you can catch demand online, but you can't create it. Meaning you can sell Nike shoes on Zappos, but how do you create demand for a brand that no one knows? And I think that's what was contrarian, that you could create demand versus just catch existing demand. And it's interesting just to, to, to have the perspective of how contrarian that was and what ultimately you built with Bonobos, because it, from my perspective, it had these evangelists, these people that, you know, would rave about Bonobos pants and it kind of spread by word of mouth. Um, but it was just always accepted that it was an online channel. That's where you went to, you know, interact with Bonobos. And I actually, I was going to bring this up um, because it was a funny moment in time. I can't uh -oh. when this was. It was after I had invested and you sent an April Fool's joke around to investors and you're like, hey, we're going to open a whole bunch of stores and we're going to do one in Greenwich, Connecticut and Palm Beach. And I forget all the places you said. And I got this and I was like, that's weird. Like, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that the Novos would open stores. And then you sent an email afterwards. It was like April Fool's joke, something like that. But then yeah, we did. Yeah, that was actually prescient, yeah. right? <laughs> we we had this thing where we started getting scared to do April Fool's jokes because it turned out that every April's Fool joke became like strategy in two years. So I think we did one on making jeans at the beginning because you may remember Bonobos at the beginning. It was it was cords and it was twill, like cotton twill, and it wasn't even khakis for a period of time. So it was like we're making jeans when the whole company was built around the idea that we were focused on non denim better fitting non-denim and then we did the stores one and then we ended up opening these guide shops and then I think at one point we did one about entering women's and then we at one point experimented you know on two occasions actually had experimented with that so there was one year we were like all right let's stop sending out April Fool's things <laughs> because they're just going to come true so so when did it go when did it go and why did it go from April Fool's joke to open stores to actually opening stores because I do think many people in the retail industry credit Bonobos and, and identify Bonobos as kind of the, the brand that really showed what you can do in building a truly omnichannel presence and accessing customers both in traditional brick and mortar retail, which feels so counterintuitive given that it almost felt like building a brand online, the venture world caught up to you by the time you decided to move offline. <laughs> so it was yeah, kind of double right. variant. I know we keep doing stuff that looks dumb. That was sort of our history. So I think that the, the Omni direct consumer path, which is the way I now think about it. I think at one point I put out something online with one confusing four letter acronym, which was, you know, digitally native vertical brands. I've now abandoned that because I think it's clear everyone's accepted D to C right as a way to talk about what's happening. But I think the letter I would put in front is an O Omni direct consumer brands, meaning it's not just through the web, it's also through, if you have other ways to commercialize it, community-wise, through those channels. And so at Bonobos, that became you know, our, our guide shop stores. And they were what I would call like a happy accident. You know, We didn't set out to do it. We were moving into button-down shirts. We were testing out customers coming through the lobbies of our uh, the lobby of our New York City headquarters, and then they just wanted to buy stuff. And we realized that we could actually sell product that wasn't there from an inventory standpoint. And that was this kernel of insight of, wait, we don't need the inventory there to sell it. What we can deliver is service. And that, that you know, snowballed into um, what is now a national footprint of Bonobos Guide Shops. And then, Brendan, the thing that happened at the same time was being like, well, all right, if we're going to open this brick and mortar strategy up, is there anyone we should be thinking about from a wholesale standpoint? And, and that was when we had opened a dialogue with Nordstrom who, who became terrific partners to the brand. And, you know, as you know, I'm no longer, I'm no longer affiliated with Bonobos because I've, I've left the company that acquired us. So I can't comment on where we are now, but I can tell you from my vantage point, 
how important both of those decisions were. The decision to open physical stores and the decision to partner um, with at least one meaningful wholesale account. And what did you learn? Like, I'm just curious, you know, you obviously spend a lot of time thinking about how customers not just engage with products, but engage with a brand. And now having obviously an online identity that, you know, Bonobos was seen as and identified as, and now like interacting, right? The first hires you make are almost important. The, the color of the walls, the design of the store, the location of the store now all need to be on brand. But when consumers interacted with that, what did they, what did you learn about customers that was interesting or counterintuitive? I mean, I think the most interesting thing is they don't actually care. Like they're not thinking about this kind of distribution strategy the way that entrepreneurs at a company are. Right. You know, as an entrepreneur at a company, you're like, this is a huge deal. We're going to go do this and it's scary. And for your customer, I, I don't, I think they sort of like, oh, I don't even remember whether I found it in a store or online. And by definition, the concept of brands predate the internet. And so people are used to the idea that a good brand shows up in many places. They're used to potentially finding it in a brick and mortar environment that isn't vertical, meaning, you know, buying Hello Bello diapers at Walmart. They're used to that. They're used to finding it in a company owned retail store, right? Um, and obviously Apple being one of the great pioneers of proving out the experiential element of it. And of course now online. And so I don't think these decisions are, um, customers don't care. They're ready to meet you wherever you are. I think they feel momentous internally in a way that actually isn't as big of a deal um, once you do it um, to your customer. Right, and did it feel when, when other brands started to emulate Bonobos, right? And started to follow this trajectory of, okay, I started online, I grew online, I'm digitally native, um, and now I'm going to become omnichannel, I'm going to open stores. Um, did it feel like Bonobos was kind of the standard bearer for that at a moment in time? I'm just curious how that felt to you. Standard bearer is a very uh, on, honorary term. A guinea pig would, would be the way that I would put it. You know, we were, we were doing things early, which isn't necessarily better. I, I, in many ways, wish we could have come later, right? Like, for example, technology. At one point at Bonobos, we thought we had to build that in-house. And we had multiple iterations of how do we figure out how we, how we do our tech stack. And now I meet entrepreneurs who have really big companies. You know, my sister's company, for example, in baby category. Monica and Andy, where you might have one person or two people in house because Shopify exists. And so when I think about these discontinuous innovations of Shopify for e-commerce software, or even Instagram for building a brand, like when we started Bonobos, Instagram didn't exist. Um, these are all these little things that have in many ways made it easier. Not that the business is easy, but they're here. Um, right. And being, being there at the beginning when you're kind of going through all that, um, feels more like, you know, guinea pig than standard bear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it ended up the, the way the narrative will be written is that it was just very forward looking and very bold because, you know, we've now built obviously a whole business around helping brands expand offline into brick and mortar retail. And I can say unequivocally Bonobos is the example that um, it feels like every landlord champions is like, look, this is what you can do. This is what is possible. This is a brand that truly pivoted its business and in pivoting made itself better. And you've, you've been a prolific investor in the consumer category. Um, and I'm curious, like when you have invested in so many spaces, I know you've invested in furniture, you've invested in the category of baby, you've invested in many different categories. What, what can be learned about like how to map the offline experience, the kind of indoctrinating your customer and what your brand means in an offline experience and mapping that to the actual product? Because I, I, I've heard you talk about that before. And I think a lot of what you said is, is this really interesting about how to make that congruent, the offline experience and what the brand means to the customer? Totally. I think it's an awesome question. I think it's important to recognize that it's gonna be different for every brand. And I think, I know that sounds obvious, but I'll give you an example. I remember when Harry's was coming up and we were, we were fortunate, um, some friends and I do have invested in Harry's in the early innings um, through this little vehicle, Red Swan, which was 
you were alluding to consumer investments. We were focused on that. And they opened a barbershop at one point in Soho, which I thought was amazing and super cool and what a smart way to build a razor brand. And then fast forward some years later and they had closed that down and opened up a relationship with Target. And now obviously it's, you know, Target, Walmart, I'm sure many, many other points of distribution. So that's a business model where the marriage for physical retail was more of a focusing on wholesale. And I think for CPG, where you have a low average unit retail price, that can make a lot more sense than doing your own experiential company owned retail. Apparel is different, right? And that's why at Bonobos and as we're doing now in Baby at Monica and Andy, when you have a kind of a medium average order value product where the basket size can merit just a few transactions a day can you know pay your rent or more, then it can start to make sense in that category. And you could say, wait, there's a wholesale relationship here as we did with Bonobos with Nordstrom. And then fast forward to a business model like Away, um, obviously, you know, during COVID, I'm sure not, not the easiest business to be operating. But I'll tell you the store around the corner from us here in New York City, it's astonishing, you know, in a, in a, in a normal economic environment, how much volume comes out of that store. Um, and I, ha I happen to know, so I won't say, just from having been an angel investor there. And that makes sense to me because that's a product where you want to go, touch and feel it, play with it. And then when you do leave, it's a sizable check size. So I think it's important to think about the specifics of the brand. There's going to be an offline strategy, in my opinion. I'd be shocked if it should just be, you know, on, online. But the way that you manifest that offline, whether the company needs to own it or not, I think depends a lot on the characteristics of the, the economics of the product and the nature of the way that the customer shops for it. You know, the right. other business that we both worked on in customizable sofas with Interior Fine is a great example of that, right? Where it's a long consideration cycle and it's a mixture of online touches, sending swatches, and the potential for an in-person experience that build the overall, um, you know, the overall way that you take the customer on that journey. And how do you think about so something I've, you know, thought a lot about in our retail fund is like, what's that natural line between like the intimacy of a product for a consumer and where offline makes sense? And I paint that as like the, the extreme examples, like, gla like glasses, right? Glasses are incredibly intimate, right? They are literally touching your face all day long. They are how people see you. It is, it is core to your identity. So of course, you'd want to try them on before making such a you know, personally important decision about your appearance. And then you can move that towards sofas. Obviously you're sitting on, you want to touch and feel baby clothes similarly. Um, but then you start to hit this line, which in my mind starts to happen right around socks, um, where <laughs> there is intimacy, there is identity that the consumer cares about, but where do you see that line being drawn? Like, will all things move offline or can you build brands around all products? Or is there some natural inflection point where it no longer makes sense and you're fine buying Duracell batteries, right? You don't really yeah. care whether it's Amazon batteries or Duracell batteries, but you definitely don't need a store to go in and buy your Duracell batteries. What is that line? Hey, for you? at some point there's gotta be a direct consumer battery company, right? I've been wondering about this. I wonder about these duopolies like batteries or tennis balls. Like right. when is someone going to make a DTC tennis ball brand? Cause these are just so expensive. Right. Um, I'm going to answer your question poorly because I, it's so confusing to me. Like there are categories that have been able to extend off offline really successfully, you know, where you'd say, wait, is that, is that as important for that category? I would, that's what, how I thought about Bonobos at the time, because the, the whole narrative was men don't like shopping. Men don't like shopping, right? And the truth is, is some men don't, right? And we, and we discovered that that's, that's, you have to create a segmentation in your customer base to really understand. And it's always dangerous to speak of your customer as an average, because there is no such thing as an average customer, right? It's the story of the, the person that drowned in a lake that was an average of three feet deep. If you focus on averages, you'll often get it wrong. Right. And then there are categories where you would think, wait, this needs an in-person experience. And I would come back to customizable sofas where I wouldn't dream of buying a sofa if I couldn't go sit on it. And my wife knows um, I'm, I'm obsessed about how does a sofa feel when you sit on it? How firm is it? Do you sink? 
What's the back like? And so when I was on the board of Interior Define, that was part of the narrative that I was pushing. And I think what we found is actually there's a lot of people that aren't like that who are happy to buy sofas online. And right now the company stores are all closed and it's absolutely surging because what, what's true is people need a place to sit that's comfortable in their home when they get it, but they don't necessarily need to go in advance. And so I'm generally intuitively um, wrong or right about that question in a way that means I can't answer it with a heuristic. Um, and what I would say is the only way to resolve it is through experimentation. And so what I encourage direct to consumer entrepreneurs to do now is just open your, your brand with a store, like do it in the same place just to see what happens. Cause you need to pay rent for your headquarters anyway. Now in COVID, maybe that's not true. I don't know, but you gotta, you gotta run an experiment to see what it's like with in-person. And then you run an experiment with wholesale to see how that goes. And then you kind of discover the strategy. It's, it's revealed to you more than it is that you dictate it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. Like that, that, there is no average to a customer. Um, and I, I was kind of uh, talking about this the other day. It was saying when you enter a Nike store, right? When you walk into a Nike store, you are, it's like entering a church for Nike, right? You are indoctrinated in the ethos of Nike, of sport, and there's this mythology of the athletes. And then there's products, right? And you, you might buy some of the products, but really it's not about the products. It's really about what Nike represents. And I was contrasting that to this company brandless that um, you know was around the concept was we're we're going to build a brand that's not a brand um, and in so doing we're going to sell directly to consumers and there's kind of like a meta irony in the fact that brandless ultimately failed because you couldn't build a brand and catch up or toothpicks or Q-tips or whatever it is um, and I just found that line fascinating of like where does a brand make sense because when I identified with Bonobos in the early days it was exactly what you said. It was like, this is a brand that gets me the customer that I don't like shopping, but I want to wear pants. Um, yes, I want to wear pants. Um, <laughs> and, and that was the brand. It wasn't so much the product. And it's just a, it's a really fascinating line to see like tested in real time with this new cohort of, uh, you, I know you don't like the term, but ENVBs, digitally native brands, the, the term you coined. Um, exploring like the contours of that and and the the limitations of that it's an amazing point right because on the one hand you want to be really focused on who your customer is so you can delight them and so i can see from a company like walmart the focus on the customer while i was there you know three years i was there was incredible and at the same time you don't want to assume that all customers are alike so who's in that Tent that you're paying attention to versus who's not, and it's complicated. And I, and I generally think it's definitely a segmentation. So there's at least three to four to five to six groups that you want to be thinking about that comprise who that customer actually is in aggregate. And then you got to think about um, who can't you serve as a function of, of the strategy. And I think for us at Bonobos, it became too untenable to build a brand where we couldn't serve people that needed to try it on in person. Right. And I think what we're now seeing as we look out at the consumer retail economy is we're probably accelerating to a digital future more quickly in a digitally native future more quickly. But I guarantee that when we come back collectively, no matter how many fits and starts there are to that, human beings are going to want to be in the physical world. Um, and so I think it's a fascinating time to be alive. Um, and for those of us who are healthy, you're fortunate you know, we're fortunate to be alive to see how do we build the, the right kind of a retail future in light of something that's accelerated us maybe 10 or 15 years ahead of schedule in terms of the overall mix of the way that um, people are, people are building retailers now. And let's just talk about real estate. So like real estate's obviously this retail real estate is this category where you open the news and all you read about is the death of retail that, you know, the, what's happening now, the surge in e-commerce transaction volumes, all this was portended by the imminent demise of retail. Um, how do you respond to those kind of like reflexive comments that retail's dying? How do you respond to that now? It's funny because at the very beginning when we were building Bonobos, I would say physical retail is gonna one day be less than online retail. You know, 
that whole narrative of software eats the world that kind of came through, through, then I believed that. And now, you know, fast forward 14 years later, I think it's more nuanced than that, which is I've seen from, you know, a few years at Walmart, how powerful in-store experience and in-store um, service is, right? And you look at kind of the online grocery pickup approach that they have. And a lot of the strategy that I saw at Walmart was built around this super center fleet and what you could do because you have that. And you may have seen this summer that they're opening up their parking lots to be drive-in movie theaters, mm. right? Which oh. is a really interesting use of the physical retail. And of course, the extension into healthcare, right? Right. Which, you know, if you're Amazon and you want to do healthcare, what do you do like compared to a Walmart where you've got this fleet of stores? And so I think it's important to think about what are the things that can't go online? Those are going to continue to live offline, right? Even as the share shift happens, of course, we're moving to less and less of the purchase transaction point being in person. That's a given. But the concept that now that's dead, I feel like we've gone guard from guardrail to guardrail. Right. You know, it's not that it's important to pay attention to and some businesses will thrive and some will go out of business, but it's not as extreme. I feel like as it's, it's like whipsawed where, yeah. you know, and I think now people are taking it too far in terms of what it means. I was thinking about this the other day. Cause I was like, you know, what can't you do online? And I had to get, well, I obviously unsuccessfully had to get a haircut and I still haven't gotten one, but I was like, you can't get a haircut. Um, there, there is no way to disrupt the haircut online. Um, that will always have to happen offline. I was thinking about my the- my wife disrupted the haircut. So, <laughs> my hair's been in seventeen years because she whipped out some scissors and fully disrupted my. And, and I was thinking about the scene in uh, I don't know if you if you remember the scene, but there's a scene in in Wayne's World where there's a machine that actually cuts cuts your hair, and I was like, that will never work, right? I'm sure someone will try, but that will actually never work, and what an opportunity, right, for retail real estate to kind of really like recast itself around these experiences that some of which do need to happen offline. As you said, like healthcare is becoming retailized, right, with concepts like forward health and one medical, we're seeing that like firsthand, like there is a, there is a retail experience that is increasingly core um, branded and differentiated versus what we've all thought of retail as or healthcare as, which is just visiting your doctor at a, at a doctor's office. Um, what do you think a landlord should be thinking about in this environment um, with respect to that opportunity to like recurate, whether it's high street retail or a mall, like a command and control environment? What should they be thinking about? What would be like first principles you would advise on? The number one problem that I see landlords make is assuming that the historical value of their asset is going to keep going up, right? So let me give you an example, right? So Bleecker Street in New York City is a beautiful piece of real estate. It's walking from the west side of Manhattan, you know, into the center. You've got great cupcakes and restaurants and nightlife, and, um, but it's empty. Because the landlords on that street, I, I, I know this because I have spent some time with them, believe that a 1,500 square foot box was worth $50,000 a month. And then begrudgingly after five years, they're like, well, maybe it's worth 40, right? And then another five years pass. And I think the issue is, is you have to reset your expectations around what the economic value is and allow retailers to come in and thrive and rebuild the value of that street. Um, And so I think, uh, you know, we have someone close to us who have a house that they built 26 years ago, (laughs) and they haven't lived there in 20 years. And and they won't sell it because just in their mind, it's, it's worth X. And the idea that I would do anything economic at half of X, I can't do it. And yet it would be economically rational to do it, right? And so what I would like to see landlords do is become enterprising. Like we have a new set of constraints. We got to offer people great deals to prove that they can build stuff. We have to experiment and maybe in some cases take equity. I'm in a situation right now where I'm trying to convince a landlord to take equity in one of the companies I'm affiliated with, recut the deal and say like, we want to be in business, but we need to change up this relationship. We'll give you some upside and will you take it? And they're having that conversation with us. And so I think 
if we're too attached to what we thought we, we were getting, we will fail, right? But if we are enterprising and say, we need to come down on rents in an enterprising way to partner with entrepreneurs and companies to create, to recreate that value, I think that's what we have to go through. And do you think that, I know obviously COVID has made, you know, uh, these discussions around percent rent and percent potentially taking equity in a given brand, they've made them more expedient. But do you think that there's a, uh, like a collapsing of this distinction? Um, and hear me out on this because it's kind of an out there concept. But when I think about a landlord, as you appropriately described, they're taking risk, right, on brands and in, in curating space and drawing foot traffic and attracting customers. And that was the old business, right? Of you've got an anchor in your mall and that drew the foot traffic and then you monetized it with the sunglasses huts and the, the inline stores in the mall. That was the game. The game has changed. And what it means is that consumer choice has exploded. So there's now just so many more brands. You used to be able to fill a mall with 200 brands. Now there's, you know, 5,000 brands that could potentially fill a mall. And so landlords are in the business of taking risk on these emerging new brands. Do you think there's this collapsing of the distinction between a venture investor, which is what we do and what you've done, um, which is like taking risk on new concepts from an equity and investment perspective and being a landlord, meaning the line between venture capitalists and the line between landlord, they start to get kind of blurry. And the reason I was thinking about this is that one, it's, it's the whole thesis for our retail fund, but also because we're seeing it play out in real time. With some of these decisions of like major landlords to buy out legacy brands. It's happening with Brooks Brothers right now. So this line between investor and landlord is getting pretty blurry. What, I guess my question is, do you think that's right that that's happening? And what's the logical extension of that? What does that mean in 2030, the business of being a landlord means? It's really fun. It's a really fun question. And I think it, yeah, I think the answer is, is it could go that way for a couple of enterprising people to figure it out because it's right now it's asymmetric risk, right? Like you bring these brands in and if they thrive, you're happy, but there's not, you don't have upside in it, which is why it's so fun. Right. This little experiment we're running, trying to cut a hybrid cash equity deal with this one unique landlord. It's really fun to have that discussion because in a landlord, you're thinking like, are they going to pay? Like, are they going to pay for 10 years every month? And I just want you to pay the rent and honor the deal. And I'm happy. And like, that's it. But just and to, with a startup, that, just to press on that point, Andy, it's like, it sounds like what you're saying is there's risk, right? <laughs> there's risk that you, you won't pay rent at some point in time or the concept won't work, but commensurate with that, with that risk is equity upside. And, and therefrom comes this alignment. Is that kind of what you're the case you're trying to make to that landlord? A little bit. And what's really fun about it is the couple that we're talking to, they had one of their brands that they really liked, got sold. And now they, they're not happy with it. And they feel like, well, we helped them get there. And then we didn't enjoy upside in that transaction. And so I think I'm having a little conversation over here and you're having this meta thought process with your vantage point, which is so much broader than mine. And I think it's really it's really fun and it, it makes sense to me. Um, and it, the analogy that came to my mind was just private label, right? So there's a moment in any department store or any specialty store where people start to think, wait, I want to actually sell my own brands within that store, right? Trader Joe's, Urban Outfitters, um, the way that Gap Inc. started was selling Levi's jeans, not, Le you know, not Levi's. And so if an individual store know. operator can make the decision to start to own brands, in theory, that's no more or less controversial than the idea that the underlying landlord could be doing the same thing. So it's a really fun concept that you, that you put out there. And I think we've seen a few landlords do that, but I don't think anyone's really tried to do it with great brands in a methodical and scalable way. Yeah, we, for, to be honest, we haven't seen it either. It's more of a, a thesis we have, which is like, any buyer of retail needs to both buy the asset, right? And we don't know what foot traffic is gonna look like in that asset. You almost wanna like over equitize and over capitalize that asset with a bunch of investment 
in the brands to attract customers. And that can mean lots of different things. That could mean investing in the brands like an investor, like a venture investor. That can mean investing in the space, right? Like actually helping the entrepreneur design really special space that's on brand that attracts customers to the other stores. But it's this distinction that's like, it's, it's converting what was a very transactional relationship, as you said, like, are you gonna pay me my rent every month? Is the, is the rent check going to show up, which is, has been the old model of retail, into more of an aligned risk-taking, um, almost uh, investment congruency between the brand and, and the landlord. That is gonna be fascinating to see how it plays out. And by the way, I agree with you, it's totally going to favor the big institutional players that already have footprints. Like what you were just describing with Walmart, right? The ability to be able to say, oh, I've got these, got these parking lots, let's turn it into a movie theater, right? And that, I imagine, attracts shoppers to Walmart. And there's, a, there's kind of a command and control environment that favors incumbency there. One of the things that I feel forged in my career is when you and I met, I was selling pants out of a bedroom. I had 400 pairs of pants in my bedroom at 17th and Irving. And when you and I connected on email, I was running the company out of a kitchen table. And by the way, the landlord of that apartment kicked me out once he found out there were five employees coming there. So uh, <laughs> that's where we started. And fast forward, you know, a decade and I got to work for a company with 2.4 million employees, right? I think it's the third largest employee base after the Chinese military and the U.S. military. 500 billion in annual sales. And one of the things I learned from watching uh, the CEO of Walmart, Doug McMillan in action, is you've got to do what you're good at rather than copying others at things that they're better at. You've got to kind of go to what you can do that others can't. Um, and I gave the examples of, you know, click and collect groceries is a great example of that, right? Fresh and frozen is really hard to do online. It's easier and potentially more economical if you actually have got thousands of points of distribution where you have great fresh and frozen. Okay, that's a place where we can win. And I think the problem that I've seen is people don't take that action when they have resources and when their business is still floating. They wait until it's too late and then the balance sheet isn't there. So what I would do right now, if I were, let's just say that you and I are right. Let's say this is a good idea. I would actually take a meaningful amount of capital and go do it, right? Like go all in, go buy 20 brands for a billion dollars, right? Go, go make 20 awesome $50 million acquisitions and like acknowledge that you have to do something existentially profound to win. And, and that's why Walmart was such a great learning for me. I can remember waking up one day and seeing that we, we'd acquired at Walmart Flipkart for 16 billion. And my brain just exploded that that was something that you could do. Right. And then I thought about it and I was like, okay, yeah, you've got India, it's the world's second biggest country and you're gonna lose to Amazon in India unless you do it. And so you just do it. And I haven't seen people outside of the creation of Fifth Wall and people taking some risk with experimentation, I haven't yet seen people in real estate acknowledge how existential the situation is be willing to ch to rewrite the rules and change and properly take the kinds of bets um that i that i saw my boss make at walmart and and hopefully COVID has been a dark time um it's been terrible that we've gone through it hopefully one of the things it does do is help people realize how fragile the existing brick and mortar infrastructure system is and how bold we need to be to continue to to like customers and employ all the people that we do. I, I mean, I wish we could talk longer because there, there's, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on just how I think about kind of the, what omnichannel means because it's exactly what you're describing. Um, this kind of, there's this dichotomy between like, yeah, you have to do something, I think as you said, profoundly existential to change what's happening, to change these secular trends that are were, were afoot before COVID and have just been accelerated. Um, but at the same time, there's this durability to place, right? That, that as we were just talking about, like people want to be in places with other people. That is core to human nature. They want to interact with things. They want to touch and feel. And, and if we shift too far into the online world, 
we somehow lose that. And if you kind of almost conceptualize the online world is like Bonobos opened up a store online. Like th that website was your real estate. Like you controlled that real estate. Um, you just didn't have to sign a lease other than maybe paying GoDaddy or some hosting company. Um, right. And venture capitalists kind of identified that very early. And now that all these things are colliding, maybe there's this new opportunity to re-envision what venture capital means and what retail means and what brands mean in this omnichannel mixed up world we're in um, post COVID. Totally. And, and to do it before it's too late. And, and in that regard, constraints are what drive innovation. And I think as an entrepreneur yourself, you know, both building companies and now your own investment firm, you know, the constraints drive innovation. And I think hopefully what, what has happened is those constraints now feel closer for a lot of people that were, they had enough cash that they could kind of figure it out. And now it's like, wait, we actually have to do this now and, and do it before it's too late. And so in a way, I think we're about to see an incredible proliferation of innovation across you know, many, many actors within the ecosystem. And I think ultimately that will be a good thing for people. It'll be a good thing for, for job creation as well. I agree. Um, well, I know both of us are rooting for that to happen. Um, and it'll be awesome to see if it does. Andy, this has been just so interesting to chat with you. It's, it's funny to think um, how far back our, our two respective stories go. <laughs> I was just thinking, if I were to tell you when I first emailed you back in 2007, hey, we're gonna be having a conversation prognosticating on the future of venture capital and retail, <laughs> you would probably would have thought I was nuts. Um, it's funny how life works like that. Um, so thank really you so much appreciate for, it. for joining. Yeah. Thanks, Brendan. Really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Andy.